jealous, cunning, manipulative, and revengeful. Those are just some negative traits of a Scorpio. These three people showed us how in the right environment, this combination of flaws can lead to the world of crime. Between 1920s and 1954, Nanny Doss killed four of her five husbands, and authorities believe she may have killed many of her blood relatives as well, bringing her victim count to 11. What were her motives? mom has got it going on that's a completely different song maya is this and it's not sandy i think it's stacy it's one of these super american names from like the 80s what <laughs> stacy's mom has got it going okay yeah that sounds right why did you sing it in the same rhythm <laughs> too why did you sing it in the exact same rhythm to <laughs> you give love a bad name you know what i had such a rebel the morning Without a joke, I listened to like their whole repertoire. Their whole, every single song that they have made has been listened to this morning. And if we are to talk about things that feel criminal but aren't necessarily true crime, revival of these TV shows. Revival of Motherfucking Rebelda. Who came up with this? Who do I need to seek for to slander on the internet? To question their motives? Who, who do I need to do? What do I need to do? Who do I need to chase after? As if the Gossip Girl revival wasn't enough. As if Will and Grace revival wasn't enough. Just do a reunion like Friends did and then whoever cares for it watches it and the rest of the people can live peacefully knowing that nobody's ruining a cult TV series. Okay, this is not why we are here today. We are here today because I survived one of the shittiest weeks. <laughs> it, was just, it was just such a meh week. Like, just nothing i mean i almost died about five times so i also started believing in astrology you know it's not astro- yeah, it is astrology like mercury retrograde shit that apparently is happening and i'm kind of starting to believe it guys i, I have to tell you kind of starting to believe that maybe sometimes things happen and it's nothing to do with me but we are here to live through to embody yet another scorpio and there is no better definition embodiment yeah let's say embodiment of all of the flaws that are prevalent to this sign done in such a way like nanny dos does it everything from perversion to insane sexual impulses insane level insane desires sexual and also in her head of what love should be. And on certain levels, obviously just speaking about the fantasies here and the level of imagination this woman has, I get it. But then you just need to know when not to push it to the next level. You just need to know when to stop. So without further ado, let me tell you a story of Nanny Doss, better known as the Giggling Granny. She had been given about a hundred monikers, but that is the one that stuck. Mostly because she giggled when she confessed to her crimes and because she smiled through her court proceedings and, well, for the rest of her life, really, after everything she had done. What did she do, though, and how was she discovered? Let us start from there. I was searching for the perfect mate, Nanny Doss would tell the police after she was arrested for murdering her husbands. The real romance in life. In Alabama, in 1954, Nanny Doss's fifth husband had just died. He was hospitalized earlier that year, he was treated and released. Because of this, this sudden death raised all of the alarms with the doctor that treated him earlier that year, who went to his wake in public in front of the whole village 
and in front of everybody requested Nanny to sign the autopsy papers. This autopsy will show that the poison has been found in Nanny's husband's system and she will finally end up getting arrested. So let us talk about Nanny and let us start from the beginning. Let's actually start not just with Nanny but with the background on her parents. To start off, let us talk about James Hazel. The year is 1905. Really, nothing is happening anywhere in the world. (laughs) Britney isn't releasing any songs. Even Titanic is still a ship, okay? So, (laughs) God. Even Titanic is still roaming the oceans or wherever Titanic roamed. James Hazel is a random ass man who we don't have pictures of on the internet and he has this farm, okay? He's not doing like the best because this farm requires a lot of work and he doesn't have money to pay any laborers. But he is a proud man, you know, proud American laborer who is taking care of everything and doesn't want to take help from anybody because he considers it charity. But he is struggling because, well, the bank wouldn't give him any loans. How is he going to pay for them? And he isn't really a looker because well, no woman would also agree to marry him. But finding a woman is really his only way out because he would get a free labor and he would also then get reputation in the society. People would finally acknowledge him. He would maybe become somebody. This is when he met Lou, and Lou appears to have been pregnant already. But you see, Lou wasn't married, and having a child out of wedlock back then was a huge no-no. To the point that Lou's dad would even try to beat that child out of her. But still, even in spite of this, Lou wouldn't confess who the father is, who she slept with, and eventually she left home. And this is when she met James Hazel, who accepted her to live on his farm, but only under one condition. He will marry her, he will accept the child as his, if she was to live on the farm, work on it, and be a free laborer for him. This is the environment in which Nancy Doss would be born on November the 4th, 1905. A week after she was born, Hazel proposed to Lou and she finally moved into the Hazel farm. Everybody in the village will assume that James Hazel was Nancy's biological father, but according to the books, according to all of the resources that I have said, James probably wasn't and inside of the household they all knew and they all made sure that Nancy will know that she is not a biological child of James's and that will become one of the prevalent things during her upbringing. But if you were following what I was saying, James was looking for a wife, yes, but that wasn't his priority. His priority was to find a laborer for this farm. So after each and every hard day of work that him and his wife would spend, Nanny was really just another task. And yet again, they made sure to engrave that into her head. She was actually put to work since she could barely walk. And he wanted more kids with Lou purely for the same purpose. To just make sure that as soon as they could walk and literally use their hands to lift anything, that he would put those kids to work as well. So they ended up having four more kids and they would time their pregnancies against the harvest times so that Lou wouldn't be heavily pregnant during the harvest so that they could, you know, make sure where and how they're investing their times. There is nothing worse than scheduled sex and this story has so many mentions of it. Anyways, they had one son and three daughters and Nanny technically became a nanny of these kids at the age of five and six while working at a farm. Because of the conditions they live in, you can only assume that they weren't great. She didn't have, like, the most up-to-date fashion choices to choose from. She was wearing 
people's old clothes, the hand-downs from other family members, she had to walk to school, and kids would, due to all of this, bully her because of her appearance, purely because she was poor. When I read about her just like walking to school, I remember that TikTok account of that guy who reenacts how our parents were telling us about how they walk to school. I'll put it in. <laughs> like nobody claims it and copyrights my ass over it. It's just always so funny because it's so drastic. It's like, no, our friends told us they were going across the fields. They had to like, I don't know, milk the cows, run a marathon <laughs> to get to school. It's just so gold that somebody actually thought of that. And that is what his whole TikTok account is. And I fully support it. So by the age of five, Nanny was made to cut the wood, plow the fields, and clear the land of weeds and debris. Just, you know, normal things that five-year-olds do. So she never technically had a childhood. She had to grow up pretty fast. Not that she had any friends close by anyways, but she just would be forbidden from seeing friends because her dad would need her on the farm. God forbid ball games and just actually playing with her own siblings. Nope. All of the free time had to be invested to put the bread on the table. And because of the extent to which this was her dad's priority, sometimes he would make the kids skip school in order to work on the farm, which would result in Annie's poor academic performance, and eventually they would all really drop out of school. So she only had a couple of years of schooling. But she found her escape in something. And that something was the romance stories. I personally don't have any problems with this, okay? As somebody who would read erotic stories at the age of 13 and hide from my parents and like the first versions of laptops and just computers that were, you know, the bulky ones, the Windows 1998, I was like, yeah, boy, delete history is the first thing I learned how to do on this motherfucker because I'm gonna leave it. (laughs) Because I'm gonna read some smut. I'm about to read some smut, but it's just where she pushes this. And it's because nobody taught her that this is not real life. Nobody taught her what to expect because she was escaping what, yes, again, shouldn't have been her real life and how a marriage works to something that is on the other end of that spectrum. And again, not reality. Even before her interest in romance, she had an event that changed her life forever. Because just like so many serial killers, Nanny would also experience the injury to her frontal lobe. So her family was traveling by a train to her uncle's house. And during this trip, the train just hit the brakes. I don't know what I saw on the rails. They just hit the brakes and then it kind of flew out of her seat and into this metal bar, full force, with her forehead. And she remembers waking up on her uncle's couch after being unconscious for a whole day. After this, for years, she would complain about severe headaches, she would have blackouts, and she would start getting depressed. And later in life, she would blame her mental instability on that incident. If she lived in a normal environment with the parents who supported her, who actually took care of her, treated her as if she was a child and not just free labor or if they had money for her to seek treatment, she might have actually gotten better in terms of her injury. But of course, this was the early 90s and such treatment probably wasn't even in place. So these headaches, these blackouts just further enforced her fantasies. And by the time Nanny was a teenager, she was full-blown dreaming of living her best life with her future husband. She was reading romance magazines, she was especially focused on the Lonely Hearts columns in those. And because of these, because how marriages were portrayed through those, she thought her way out of her current lifestyle was through marriage. You know, she would imagine farms, but different farms. Farms where she would be the lady riding all of the horses, doing all of the posh things. And she would be the one in charge of all of the labors. 
But if she wanted to put anything that she learned in these novels into action, she couldn't really do it under her father. Because Nanny's father forbade all of his daughters from wearing makeup, attractive clothing, because he believed that would obviously prevent them from being molested by a man. You know, those good old outdated views. He also forbade them from socializing. Going to dances, any other social events? No, you can't get molested. But the molestation came actually from within the family. If he was actually sincerely worried about them being molested, well, he would have done something about his daughters getting molested by one of the uncles. You see, the family had this creepy uncle who at first started molesting one of James's biological daughters. And when James found out, he beat this person. He was like, yeah, you're not gonna go and molest one of my kids. But then this person moved on to Nanny and started chatting Nanny up, starting sexually assaulting Nanny, and James just didn't care. So soon enough, this uncle learned, well, okay, so James's biological children are off limits, but Nanny isn't. As if this wasn't enough, after getting molested by one of her uncles, Nanny would then come home and speak to her dad, complain about this. But her dad would say, well, I mean, are you sure you didn't provoke him? You wore a dress that day. Yeah, actually, you see, your collarbone wasn't covered. Mm, it was all your fault. Not just that, but Nanny, you are going to end up just like your mother. You are going to end up pregnant and having a child out of the wedlock. So Nanny quickly thought of a plan. At the age of 15, she told her dad she's going to get a job herself so that she doesn't have to work on the farm. And of course, yeah, he can keep the percentage of her earnings. So she got a job at this linen thread mill and finally started actually having a life. Socializing with people at the workplace and eventually meeting a man in person, not just through ads or through her romance novels. This is where she would meet a 17-year-old guy called Charlie. Charlie was a hard-working man, he was showing some work ethic, but also was nice and pleasant to talk with. And what Nanny loved was that he seemed to have a great connection with his own mom. He would use his paycheck to take care of her. <laughs> to which I put red flag. Red flag, I was like, I don't know where this is going when I heard this in the story. But I was like, mm, this is some telenovela shit. This is some mommy issues. This is gonna come back to bite us in the ass. But when Nanny introduced Charlie to her family, her dad loved him because of this. Because he was a hardworking man. And also, in my opinion, because finally there would be one less mouth to feed if he was to actually get Nanny married to this guy. So after only four months of dating, Nanny and Charlie would end up getting married. As we come, we come to the wedding night, guys. They had their first sexual experience. Well, it was Nanny's first. I don't know what this guy's sexual life was all about. But for Nanny, it wasn't what she expected. It wasn't the same way that she would read about it in these novels. It didn't happen just like it did for all of her favorite characters in these novels. To which I put in the script. I don't know what I'm on when I write this. Same girl, same telenovelas did nothing to dampen my desire and break me from reality. Sorry, what? <laughs> but yeah, you see, if you are by any chance a teenager right now, hello, Violetta, I see you, I hear you. And if also, unlike Violetta, this is my friend sister, by the way, to like give a shout out to every now and then. Because this is the only family that loves me and listens to me wholeheartedly. Just kidding. Anyways, if you are a teenager who is hooked on telenovelas and thinks that that is how it's going to happen, just uh, unhook yourself <laughs> from telenovelas. Or maybe just get a reality, like watch porn. I don't know what to tell you. Find a balance in between the two because it's never going to happen like it happens on cameras. Anyways, after this disappointing experience, well, the next morning she comes downstairs to make a breakfast, to be a perfect wife for her husband, and in the kitchen she realizes that Charlie's mom is just sitting at the table expecting a breakfast. And she's like, uh, what the fuck are you doing there? She doesn't say it like that. 
but the mom is like what you mean like <laughs> silly i'm the mom that he takes care of like i of course live with you you see i told you the mom the mom is gonna become dangerous she's gonna she's gonna be a prevalent mommy issues are gonna be showcased from now on so the mom was really dampening the desire the atmosphere everything because due to the mom living in the house the two of them couldn't go on dates house had to be run the way the mom wanted everything had to be cleaned and done the way that she wanted and even if they would make any plans to do anything apart from work and come home and then work for her mom, well, she would get sick suddenly, you know, like, she'd be like, oh my god, I actually have such a headache, like, nanny, would you make me my favorite soup or whatever. And here, nanny was expecting to escape from her home life, from everything that she knew as a child, and this is the marriage now. This is not what she expected, and she is stuck. So, just like she did when she was a teenager, now she's still using these novels to escape. But her mother-in-law would catch her reading these novels, and she would say that is actually cheating. This woman, listen, I don't know when this woman was born, the mother-in-law, but this bitch was onto some manipulative Scorpio things as well. Because, so, imagine you are at a dinner table with your mother-in-law and your husband and the mother-in-law is like oh my days you see charlie i'm so happy that your wife is not like all of these women of the street that read those smutty romance novels you have such an amazing wife and charlie would sit there be like you're right mom you know you are so so right so then he would have to be hiding these romance novels, but the mother-in-law would find them and then throw them away. So then, well, then he started smoking because she was just stuck with this mother-in-law. And she also suspected that her husband isn't just not coming home on time, but he's also cheating after work. So she started following yet another habit that she learned from the Hazel household, and that is strategically getting pregnant to get what she wants. Between 1923 and 1927, she would get pregnant four times, literally one right after the other. But she was getting pregnant to start getting sympathy from others because Charlie wouldn't be going home, taking care of the children, and also in order to then leave these children with the mother-in-law to take care of, while she, Nanny, also started hitting the bars. The focus here, in particular, was really on that sympathy. This is when she started properly getting off on it. Because she actually loved the kids, or publicly loved her kids. She would keep records of Charlie's affairs and use those records to blackmail him. Because she knew that due to this sympathy, due to her being seen as a perfect mom, she was more likable. With her mother-in-law as well, because she would also see that Charlie didn't care about the kids, didn't really take care of them or Nanny, but mostly within the village. But it wouldn't come as a surprise that she was faking all of this. Soon she realized how much easier her life would be if she was only to have one child. That way she would be able to fully commit to only one kid and she wouldn't neglect most of them and also herself in all of that, you know, because of course it's much easier to take care of one kid rather than four. But she didn't think about that in 1923. She was thinking about that as they were growing up. Normal people would think this, would have that thought in their head and be like, well, wishful thinking, because uh, I don't have one child, I have four. So even if you are thinking the most drastic way about this, you'll be like, okay, maybe let me adopt some of these children out. But no. You see, Nanny really fixated on the idea of only having one child left. So one day, Charles went on one of his benders. He would sometimes disappear for days. And three days later, he returned. And he returned to the whole town being at his house. And they were all there mourning two of his kids. These kids apparently ate this porridge. 
The doctor had been rushed to the house. It appeared that the grains in this porridge were bad. So he declared the cause of death as the food poisoning. And even the mother-in-law was there, sympathetic with Nanny, saying Nanny could have done nothing to prevent this. And everybody's just looking at Charlie like, where were you? Your kids died like three days ago. Where, where, why would you abandon your wife and child like this, Charlie? After this, Charlie knew that Nanny was responsible. He just also knew that even if he was to try to prove it, the sympathy of the whole town is on her side. But every time he would actually decide on his own accord to stay at home, not to go on one of his benders, he was more and more paralyzed with fear. He actually fully believed that Nanny would kill him as well. So one day, as Nanny was sleeping, he grabbed his oldest daughter, Melvina, and got out of that house. And he didn't grab the other child, the youngest one, purely because the youngest one was sleeping in Nanny's bed. But now, Nanny wakes up, realizes Charlie's gone. She's like, okay, motherfucker, so you just decide to take one of my children and go out with me. And she doesn't do the math, realizing that this is perfect, quote-unquote, in her head, because she has only one child and can move the fuck on. No. She's like, I will have my revenge. And soon enough, the mother-in-law that she's left with now starts getting more and more sick. She's bedridden. And the only thing that she could digest, the only thing that she would want to eat, were Nanny's signature stewed prunes. That sounds so, so disgusting. So, Nanny's mother-in-law, it will come as no surprise, also dies. And eventually Charlie would return with Melvina and also another woman in 1928, which will lead to them getting divorced and Nanny taking both of her daughters and moving back in with her parents. She started working at a cotton mill so that she doesn't have to work on her father's farm again. And at this point, she's 24. She's back at her parents. It's not ideal. But this time, she really doesn't want to rush. She wants to find a perfect man. She wants to find her soulmate, finally, to have that sexual experience of a lifetime. Because this is a podcast episode fully focused on sexual experiences... If you have watched Anavas or just any series, let me know what is the most unrealistic plot or just, yeah, I mean, or sexual experience that you have witnessed, portrayed on television. The first thing, the thing that I'm doing this sideline for that comes to mind, there was this telenovela that I lost my mind over, but then reflecting in hindsight, it was so wrong on like so many different levels. It was called Cuidado con el Angel or Solo Cuidado con el Angel. I don't know, like be careful with an angel. (laughs) Doesn't matter. (laughs) It's It's like such a stupid fucking title. The whole plot was that this woman, you know, the pobrecita, the poor woman, she was to fall in love with a rich man, just like literally every telenovela. But, but this one was fucked up on the next level because she was scarred in the past because she had been sexually assaulted, rather raped, really. Um, And she blocked that out of her memory. Like, she blocked the man's face. And you know where this is going. She will end up getting married to this guy, who, by the way, is a psychologist. (laughs) So he could technically cure her. But hey, it just ended up that he was her rapist. And she remembers the face after they do it, after the wedding night. The series goes like off tangent so many times. But by the end of it, the two of them end up together. And everybody vouches for it. We were like, oh my god, this is the best love story ever. And you're like... No, <laughs> watching, looking back on it, like, she married her rapes. What are we on about? So, yeah, and he, he knew. He, he, of course, knew, but didn't tell her. Listen, <laughs> that I still find so problematic on so many levels because of how much I loved this series when I was 15. Like, what was wrong with me? What was wrong with me? 
So anyways, where are we with Nanny in this story? Okay, so she's 24, back with her parents, doesn't want to rush. She wants somebody who is independent from her mom. Hey, so she, at least, at least she's learning from her mistakes. But she also knows that she doesn't want the old guys. Mm -mm, because why would they not marry? They're definitely unmarried for a reason. So she hits the lonely hearts columns. <laughs> so you were getting there. And then you literally like hit the Tinder of the 1920s. And you're like, great, nanny, nanny, we gotta get a grip. She doesn't, she never does. So when she would correspond with these people in the Lonely Hearts columns, she would obviously then move on to letters. She would send them picture of herself. And she would also send them all the baked goods. She was a great cook. And they loved her. They loved the picture. Whenever they would meet her, they would say that she looked even better in person. And they, of course, loved what she was sending them in terms of the baked goods. But also in terms of what she would say in those letters. Because by this point, she could have been a writer writing a freaking romance novels. She could sell what she wanted in the bedroom that she actually expected. And people were like, whoa, this is going to be amazing. <laughs> and this, ladies and gents, is how Nanny met her next husband. He will end up driving to her farm was, and this guy had other issues that Nanny will not see through, she will not learn from this yet, because this guy was a typical love bombing expert. So he would shower Nanny with gifts in two months, actually. So this wouldn't even take four months. No, in two months, he would propose and everybody supported this. Like the Jameses, the Hazel household loved him. So, less than a year after her first divorce, Nanny would meet her second husband, Robert. Now, they moved from their city in Alabama, where Nanny's family was, to Jacksonville with Nanny's two daughters, Melvina and Florine. But, you see, after two months, only, only two months of this marriage, like, woman, you could have just waited four months, like, with the first one. No, Nanny realizes that Robert actually likes to drink a bit. Yeah, he likes to do some couple of shots after his work. And also something that he didn't really tell her was, well, police would ring Nanny and would ask her to come get Robert out of the prison because he would end up getting drunk while Nanny was cleaning, cooking, <laughs> riding that dick is what I added to that script. And he was out drinking. So most of his benders would end up with him just falling on the street, being found or getting into fights in clubs. The police would call Nanny to come pick him up. And on one such occasion, this police officer told her, you know that he has like a criminal record for assault? You would think this would be the end of it. She would finally realize, okay, this isn't for me. Fuck it, I tried it. I wasted four months of my life. No more. I'm gonna go back to my dad, my mom. I'm gonna go back to the house. I'm gonna start from scratch. No, she would end up being married to this man for 16 years. Listen, I don't understand it either. And not just that, but her coping mechanism here was to join him in these benders. Because I guess if you can't be them, you must simply join them. So for years, it's just the kids raising themselves while Nanny and Robert are both working and then just drinking after work. And because this is the lifestyle that these kids are witnessing, when Melina was 18, she also wanted to get the fuck out of this household, just like Nanny. She was fed up. So just like Nanny did, she finds a guy to marry, she meets him with the family, Nanny loved him. But as soon as the two of them get married, Melvina and the guy named Robert, in 1943, Melvina gets pregnant and Nanny was pissed. It's going to ruin her life. It's going to ruin her daughter's life, just like it ruined hers. So first child gets born, oh, Nanny gets over it, you know, it's not really her place. But then, as soon as she's out of the hospital, she gets pregnant for the second time. And Nanny is fuming. Like, it's not your life to live, woman. But no, she is seething. She's sitting and thinking, oh, what am I going to do? I must do something. 
people simply need to reduce the amount of children that they have. And I need to decide upon that, apparently, with all of my family members. So as soon as Melvina gives birth to the second child, Nanny is there in the hospital. She is taking care of him. Melvina collapses after she gives birth. Melina is tired, is shattered after the hours of labor. She falls asleep and Nanny is there cradling the child. But as soon as Melvina wakes up and is like, hey, mom, yeah, give me my child. Like, let me, you know, meet them, cradle them in my arms, figure out what name I should give them. Actually, the doctors come in with the grim facial expressions. Because, you see, it must have been that baby's oxygen was cut off due to this long birth. So the baby has actually died. Both Melvina and Florine did not buy into this. They actually thought that their mother came there with one of those huge hats. I had to Google this because both of them believed their mom came there purposely with one of those huge hats that women would wear at the time. I'll put it on the screen if you are watching on YouTube. And then, as soon as Melvina passed out, her mom took a hat pin which is so long and sharp, she would take this head pin and then stick it into the baby's head. I don't know how that wouldn't cause like insane amount of bleeding, but this is what they believed she did. And this is how they believed she killed this baby because Nanny thought that Melina should only have one child. Due to this death of the child, Melvina and her husband started drifting apart. And I don't know if they got divorced or they just separated. But soon enough, Melvina, in order to cope with the grief, started dating another soldier. And of course, Nanny disapproved of this and started doing what she does best, getting the sympathy on her side. Because Melvina would go off with the soldier for a few days, leaving her first child behind. So the whole village would yet again be thinking, where is she? Oh my god, look at Nanny, such an angel. She's taking care of this child while her daughter is just gone dating God knows who. You'd think at some point that Nanny is going to like look at the mirror and be like, See, maybe, just maybe, I am becoming the mother-in-law that I have always despised. But no, Nanny is now taking care of this child of her grandson. And she really doesn't, doesn't really enjoy this. She didn't picture this, you know. She only pictured having one child and now not really taking care of another grandchild. So eventually, Robert ends up dead. And they contribute this to a cot death, or what would today be called SIDS, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. But because the autopsy was never performed, nobody would find out that Robert actually died due to arsenic poisoning. Because Nanny would keep arsenic on the top shelf, just so nobody accidentally uses it. Because arsenic at the time was sold in a packaging that looked just like baking soda, in terms of the content, in terms of the packaging as well. And, I mean, that day she just baked cookies with some arsenic in them. And two months later, Nanny will end up profiting out of this death and would take $500 life insurance on Robert. Because of all of these sudden deaths, everybody in Nanny's environment starts getting really off vibes and they're like, okay, yeah, you see how doctors believe you? We don't. We live with you. So her second husband, who has been married to her by this point for 16 years, starts spending all of his time outside of the house. Just like her first one, he is petrified. He is scared for his life. But Nanny is callous. She is smart. She might not be learning from her mistakes at the speed that we want her to do, but she knows if she just kills him, the town is going to find out. They're gonna know this can't be contributed to a caught death. He was abusive, and the town has seen them arguing in the pubs, and they would see them drinking. People would just know. And maybe, just maybe, Nanny 
would have changed her mind if Robert changed any of his actions. But there was a straw that broke the camel's back here. And that straw was 1945. Japan surrendered to the Allied forces at the end of World War II, and Robert, like clockwork, like expected, went out to celebrate. And after the whole night of drinking, after the whole bender, he returns home and he wakes up Nanny in order to rape her. So, of course, the next morning she wakes up and she is done. This is her last straw. But she needs to be smart about it. And she knows alcohol is, of course, his weakness. This is why everything had happened in the first place. But because he was so scared of her, this man started hiding alcohol from her because he was scared she's going to poison him. Justifiably so, you could really say. So, Nanny went into her garden as always to tend to it. She, of course, had everything looking perfectly on the surface. And as she's tending to her garden, she just looks at her roses, the area where her roses were, and she sees a hole. She's like, God damn it, he fucking ruined my garden. Like, how dare this man? Like, I'm seriously gonna kill him. She bends down and... She realizes as she looks inside of that hole that this is where he hid his whiskey bottle. So she quickly goes to the kitchen, being like, probably singing whatever the tune was of 1945, whatever was top of the charts. She was blasting that shit in her head the whole day. She puts some arsenic into that bottle. And as soon as he comes home, he goes into the garden, digs up that bottle, drinks all of that whiskey, and then he would find him outside, lying with the whiskey bottle still in his hand. So she quickly takes the bottle, goes inside, washes it out, maybe pours some alcohol just so, you know, it seems like it isn't completely cleared. I would assume she isn't really that dumb and just returns it into his hand. And then she calls the doctor. Of course, why would they perform an autopsy? Why would anybody have a single brain cell in this story? They're just like, oh my god, he must have drank himself to death. So, a few days after, Nanny gets the life insurance, and now she's done. She is done with men. She really doesn't need one now, you know? She has the money, she's a bowler. Oh, if only this is where the story would end. She could have actually gone undiscovered. If this was it, if this was her realization, I'm not vouching for it. I still feel karma's gonna get you. But if she only knew when to stop. But (laughs) the next line in my script is Scorpios really be loving that dick. We really be delusional. So now, with this money, she actually buys a house, but she goes back to the lonely hearts again. She can't give up on love, guys. She takes a different approach, though, because now she's kind of rich to a certain degree. She doesn't really have any children to take care of, anybody's grandchildren, because she mostly killed most of her family members. So for two years, she's traveling, and she's using these Lonely Hearts ads to meet men in these different states. I mean, as I put it here, she's living the dream. Like, just don't get married. Continue this. She, it's groundbreaking for what? 1945 to 1947. This shit is like, she could have been a pioneer hoe, okay? <laughs> she could have done so much for the hoes of this world. But no, of course not. She uses the Lonely Hearts ad to meet another guy. This guy's name was Arlie. And she married him while traveling through North Carolina. And I just met him, but it was this time, three days were enough. Woman, will you ever learn? So after only three days of dating, she marries this guy. Of course, um, Arlie had his vices, so um, he was also an alcoholic. And really, really, this is unforgivable, Nanny, because we always know that she knew why men wouldn't be married if they're, like, in their 40s. And Arlie was. So why wasn't he married? Well, because apart from being alcoholic, he was also a womanizer. 
But then he thought she could change him. Oh yeah, this is the trait that I cannot relate to. I don't think this is in the Scorpio's astrology maps of this world. Because we are delusional, but we don't want to change nobody. We purely just want you in our lives for maybe like 5% of it and then let us be in peace. As a womanizer, Arlie here would keep accidentally sleeping into women's vaginas. You know the reference. You must know the reference. Oh God, let me play it. <laughs> let me play it. I don't even know what show this is, but this has to be played. Now, boys were six weeks old. My husband had a terrible accident. Um, it was a really really hard time in my life um he tripped and fell and landed in his co-worker's vagina and he's still stuck there her acting is so on point this is what gets me every time well arlie would keep accidentally sleeping into women's vaginas and also then staying there to sleep at their houses so just imagine the embarrassment. She thought she could change this man and every single day he comes back home at like 10 in the morning you're like, hey, husband. I'd, I mean, would I want to poison them? Every single one of her husbands? Possibly. But then, you know, I would also seek therapy if that was ever to cross my mind. She doesn't. So Nanny's approach to this to teach him a lesson would be she would write him a note and then leave it on the kitchen table. And the note would say BRB or something as ambiguous as that. Like, I'll be right back. And then she would return in a week, sometimes in a month. So both of them started hoeing and just living their best life on the side while also being married. And I suppose that could have also worked. But then influenza hit. And now both of them had to spend most of their time at home. And I guess after you marry a guy after three days and, well, you spend most of your year just hoeing around and not spending any time with him, then when you do, you kind of are like, who the fuck did I marry? Like, what is this person? What is his agenda? And one day, Nanny just decides to make a pie. One of his favorites. And when he collapses after eating that pie and the doctor gets called, well, this doctor just discards it as another case of flu. Influence is raging through the city right now as we speak. To her neighbors, Nanny would evoke sympathy yet again. She would say, why, let me tell you, he looked in fine shape. Then, well, two days later, then I nursed him, believe me, I nursed him, but I failed. Poor, poor Arlie. You know what he said to me before he breathed his last? Nanny, he said. Nanny, it must have been the coffee. Only eight weeks after Arlie died, the house where they lived caught on fire. And now, had the house survived, it would have gone to Arlie's sister in his will. But because it didn't and because... Nanny saved all of the valuables that she wanted out of it just before it burned. You know, she said like, oh, the TV is up for repair anyways, when they found the TV in her car. The insurance company would also issue a check to her. So Nanny packs up her things and she moves in with her sister this time. But her sister was actually bedridden. I'm not sure whether it was influenza or what it was. And I mean, there were already eight weeks that have passed. Nanny, Nanny had to get down to business. Nanny just quit. She needed to get laid, guys. And her sister was clearly getting in the way of Nanny getting that D. So she had to die. At her funeral, Nanny learns that her dad has also died and she is pissed she's in pissed because oh my god my dad has died and nobody told me no she's fuming because she didn't get the chance to kill him after everything he put her through after him not believing that she had been molested after him using her as free labor so she moves into the hazel farm in order to take care of her mom but here's something that nanny had forgotten 
that is that her mom was always a bossy one. Her mom was always a dictator as well. She was running this place now and she was telling her what to do, how to do it, just like she did when she was a child, just like her mother's-in-law did. So she had to go. Here, under the cover of influenza, under the cover of her mom's old age, she finally managed to get off of this triad of things that she thrived on, mostly run by sympathy, her being seen as this great caretaker, and her being the sole beneficiary. So there was always the monetary gain with Nanny. And after her mom's death, rather most probably murder, Nanny would actually go even a step further because, of course, you gotta escalate. You gotta commit to finding a life partner. So this time she joined this correspondence association. So Lonely Hearts ads wouldn't cut it no longer. She joined this correspondence group called the Diamond Circle Club. Here you had to pay a membership of about $15 per year. The suitors and the ladies would get a monthly newsletter in the post and this newsletter would kind of showcase all of the newest members and what they're looking for in a man or a woman. And Annie lived for this shit. She's 47 at this point, by the way, but no, mentally still 15. Through this Diamond Circle Club, she would end up meeting a guy named Richard from Jamestown, North Carolina. The two of them would get married in 1952 in Kansas. We don't really know much about this marriage because, yet again, it didn't really last for too long. It lasted for only a couple of months. And during this marriage, she was also nursing under entre comillas, quote unquote, her mom. But we know that Richard wasn't an alcoholic, but that he was also hoeing about. And before Nanny would end up poisoning him, she made sure to kill her mom, and then Richard would die a couple of months later. So by 1953, she is single yet again. She went back to chatting and looking for yet another perfect guy that she could change. And this time, she was looking for boring. She was like, listen, find me somebody conservative, somebody that sits at home, that isn't abusive, that isn't an alcoholic, that isn't a fucking hoe. And she actually managed to find such a guy in Samuel Doss. This guy was from Oklahoma, he had a steady job, he spoke softly, he was well-read, he would even help out around the house, he would help her cook, he didn't give that, oh, I'm the king of the house, I'm just bossing you around attitude, he was not threatening, he wasn't violent, he was actually boring as fuck. He worked from home, so there was no cheating, she moved to Kansas to live with him, Yet again, she just can't see through any red flags. I mean, this guy on the surface is perfect. But then Nanny one day decided to do her hair again. She went to the hairdresser and as she's sitting there, these women start gossiping and they're saying, oh, Nanny, it's so actually great how understanding you are of your husband. I mean, I've heard Jenny down the street got some gifts from him. Yeah, and the other the other day, oh, Sandy, Sandy down the road. Oh, my God, the necklace that your husband has given her. So Nanny is there seeding. She has to go through the whole treatment of getting her hair done while just keeping calm, like, of course I'm aware of my husband giving gifts to other women, like, just ruminating in her mind, like, what am I cooking next? What does he enjoy eating? What the fuck am I going to put into his food to poison the living shit out of this man? And this was definitely the alarm bell sounding, but if Nanny only paid attention... This was far from the only red flag that Samuel Doss has had, okay? Nanny has actually previously, in the few months that she lived with him, she was already irritated by him because, yeah, he was always at home, so you would suppose, oh, that's great. But you see, bedtime was also scheduled at 9.30 p.m., So there was this automatic agenda to their day. Also, Samuel was sparing every single penny. So, you know, 
radio, television, that couldn't exist. Why would you laugh at somebody's comedic output out there? Love stories, taboo. Oh my god, romance novels and magazines. That is, that's smart. That's cheap. No wife of mine should read that garbage. He would be sparing pennies on literally everything. Like, heating wouldn't be on unless it's, I don't know, Christmas Day. She'd only be given the exact amount of money that she needed to buy the groceries, like, to a penny, so that she can't spend it on anything else. Sex, not to even mention, but of course was pre-scheduled, because you gotta have sex before you go to sleep promptly at 9.30pm exactly. So, I'm sorry, if nobody breaches the culmination, if nobody reaches an orgasm by 9.30, that's it. We call it quits. We sleep, woman. So, of course, because of him pinching the pennies, well, Nanny actually, even before this gossip at the hairdressers, decided to go back home to just, like, I don't know, get warm next to a fireplace instead. And as she did, he started writing her letters, pleading for forgiveness. To show that he is serious about Nanny and about her coming back, he actually even opened up the pocketbook. He said he is going to put the will in her name and he, once she returns, she will have the control of his finances. She's going to rearrange the bank account so that she can have access to it. And of course, this is exactly what Nanny wanted. And once she returned and also heard about the gossip that maybe he isn't as faithful and good-natured as he portrays himself to be, well, he ended up being hospitalized. But here she fucked up. She didn't put enough arsenic in whatever food she made. And here it might not even be the level of poison. It might actually be that this guy was actually in better health than her ex-husband. Like he wasn't an alcoholic. He took care of himself and his health. So at first he was only hospitalized. And then he's by his side. And he's thinking, oh my god, this woman really loves me. I gotta, I gotta put her in my will. I gotta give her even more money. But then once they return from the hospital... She decides to celebrate his good health with another healthy cake. She's gonna make that cake with some more prunes in it. It was said that the words that sealed Sebil Doss's fate were Christian women don't need a television or romance magazines to be happy. After she poisoned his cake, we pick up with the beginning of our story, with the discovery of Samuel Doss and also the only person in this story with, like, a single brain cell. And that is the doctor that treated him for months and that needed proof. Finally, he needed an autopsy, but he knew if he was only to approach Nancy by herself, she wouldn't go for it. She needed to sign the documents. So he decided to approach her during the funeral in front of all of the town's people, because she cared so much about how she was perceived by everybody. And this is how he got her to sign the papers. And once the authorities ran the autopsy, they found arsenic in his system, they arrested Nanny. And they would end up exhuming some of her previous victims as well, finding arsenic or red poison in all of their bodies. And now that they have her in the police station, everybody said... When they were questioning her, she would just like do a little bit of a (laughs) giggle. And at first she wouldn't even confess. By the way, um, if you start dating somebody and if they laugh when they argue with you, like the first argument, and they start laughing in the middle of it, I'm not saying break up with them because I do this. (laughs) It's like the most disturbing thing. But sleep with one eye open, okay? Because that person is not really the most mentally stable one ever. So... The police officers, hour after hour, they're grilling this woman, trying to get her to pay attention to them and not like the romance magazines that were on the table. Why the fuck were romance magazines on the table in the police station? So this is some dialogue that I have from the books. Put the magazine down, Nanny, and listen to us. Nanny, Nanny, look at us. Why did you kill Doss? They wanted to rip the magazine that was inside of her hands, but 
they found it difficult to get rough because they saw a sweet grandmotherly type in front of them. And then, you know, as she was reading those magazines, she would do that harmless, like, <laughs> giggle, <laughs> giggle. It was like the Dolores Sunbridge in this bitch. Nanny, we've been here for hours now. Aren't you getting tired? You kill him. You killed him. We know you killed him. You know you killed him. Oh, boys, come on now. I killed nobody. I don't know why you think I did. <laughs> we've made calls, Nanny, and we've learned that Mr. Doss was your fourth husband to die of the same symptoms. We're putting two and you together, Nanny, and it looks like we just might come up with, well, four. Arsenic, Nanny. We believe that they all died of arsenic. It will be easier if you admit what you've done, ahead of the time, I mean, before we have to find out for ourselves. Are you saying, young man, that I killed all of my husband? <laughs> You're a nice-looking young man, but so foolish, as she flips over a page of the romantic cards that's in front of her. Finally, this police officer had some common sense. He reached over and took that magazine from her, saying... No more reading, Nanny. This isn't a Christian science reading room. You're gonna answer us. At this time, she looked at him, not giggling. Probably because this is what every single one of her husbands did, taking away her escape. Nanny, there are others, too, aren't there? A lot of people around you dropped dead over the last couple of decades, and their ghosts are coming back to haunt you. They're here, Nanny, in this room. Put them to rest, Nanny. Put them to rest. For a moment, their eyes would meet, and she knew it. She sighed, heaved, and nodded. All right, all right. Then she giggled again, and she confessed. She poisoned Doss's coffee, actually, not food as they believed. But she didn't do it because she was malicious. He wouldn't let me watch my favorite programs on the television. And he made me sleep without a fan on the hottest nights. He was a miser. And well, what's a woman to do under these conditions? Then she told him about Richard Morton, Arlie Lanning, Frank Harrelson. All men that at first she admired, but they turned out to have flaws. How dare they? She only wanted romance. She only wanted a man to love her. But instead, she got what she would describe as dullards. Each and every one of them. She concluded her confession by saying, if their ghosts are in this room, they're either drunk or sleeping. <laughs> I can't. I cannot with this woman. So, um... Yeah, of course, she went to trial. The state of Oklahoma found her guilty of murder. All of the different state justice departments of the states where she committed her crimes, like North Carolina, Kansas, Alabama, also charged her. But she was never tried outside of Oklahoma. So, at 48 years old, she was facing an electric chair. If she was to become the first woman in Oklahoma history to be executed... But two years later, a judge declared her insane, sparing her the death penalty. Instead, she got a life in prison. But after only two years in prison, she started to hate it, the fact that she got a life sentence. And she wished instead that she had been put to death. When she would get interviewed in prison, she complained with the fact that she's such a good cook. But her skills aren't being exploited because, well, nobody in the right mind would let her work inside of the kitchen. So she's saying, oh, I freaking hate doing the laundry. Like, this is what I hated on the outside. I just hate that this is my only job. And all of the offers that she would submit and applications to work in the kitchen were nicely and politely declined. She ended up dying of leukemia on June 2nd, 1965, on the 10th anniversary of her getting inside of the jail cells. And she was buried in Oak Hill Memorial Park in McAllister of Oklahoma. So let us speak about the motives, because this woman had a couple of issues. So, so delusional. On the next level, if I ever get there or if I ever get to the point where I'm scheduling my sexual intercourse, just just 
God take me out. This take me a heart attack. I don't care. Take me the fuck out. What I've seen, I'm not sure. Is this Todd Grande? Probably. Probably Todd Grande or like other doctors who looked at Nanny Doss's case said that the head injury shouldn't be neglected. I mean, it is correlated with so many other serial killers and their crimes. But that this is something that today we would probably see as schizophrenia due to the hand injury or like another disorder that has to do with mental health due to the head injury. But then regardless of it, despite of it, she actually made all of these decisions on her own. As I mentioned, she thrived on sympathy. She thrived on revenge. She was pissed off all of her life at what she couldn't have and she was taking it out at the targets that she seemed deserving of death. Here the targets were her kids and husbands because they were the reality check once she would snap out of her honeymoon phase. And yes, I think the secondary motive or tertiary here would definitely be the monetary gain. The life insurance that she would get out of it But again, it just seemed like that wasn't enough because had that been enough, she would have stopped like halfway through this story. At the point when she had enough money to travel, to live her best life, she wouldn't have just continued doing this. So there was something driving her, her actually finding a man and then just probably getting actually addicted to the fact that she couldn't prove herself right. So... She had to kill them because they just didn't fit the picture that she imagined, how she envisioned them to be. And then I went down the rabbit hole to research poisoners because, I mean, that is her modus operandi. That is how she did it. And motives for poisoners usually include money, elimination, jealousy, revenge, and sometimes political ambition, depending on what the person is actually focusing on who their targets are. And interestingly, what I find that matches Nanny to a T is that convicted poisoners tend to have a sense of inadequacy for which they compensate through a scorn for authority, a strong need for control, wish fulfillment fantasies, and a self-centered exploitative interpersonal style. Often, poisoners are spoiled or a child raised within an unhappy home. Because of this, Poisoner's personality actually is usually full of immature desire for his or hers own way. And this, which perfectly fits here, leads Nanny to try to control and manipulate the world. It is just as if they never learn how to grow up and determine what they want, just as the child does inside of a candy shop. Take me to the candy shop. Just finish the goddamn paragraph. Well, <laughs> this article did poisoners no justice, and I love it. This person was like, no, they're mean, so I will be mean about them. Developmentally stunted. Poisoners view others without empathy and their internal compass is guided by greed or lust rather than morals. And because poisons take time to be detected, and that's why so many people through history have gotten away with this shit, the power and control poisoners experience just further increases their sense of confidence in their further poisoning. So they get hooked on it, they finally have the power, and they just never stop. She got And that is the story of Nanny Dos. Now you're going into your next Zoom call, and I am going to eat KFC before <laughs> I get to start my shift today. So listen, KFC is very underrated. This is what I want you to think about and start conversations of in your next Zoom call. You would think, okay, maybe McDonald's or like, I don't know, Wendy's, whatever. Your poison is, you're like, no, this is my fast food chain. But then you find Colonel's chicken, two pieces, four pieces, however many pieces in KFC. And you discover the world. Okay.
So, um, yeah. What is your favorite fast food chain? And what was the discovery that made you open your eyes to it? It made you realize you have been sleeping on this your whole life. Yeah, sometimes the topics are serious. And then they turn to this. So... I'm going to leave you pondering on that thought and in pondering what your fast food chain is, what the fast food chain of your life, of your dreams is, you do what? You make this world, oh, surely you make it so much better of a place. How do you do it? Listen, listen, this next line might not make sense (laughs) when we are talking about children, but you do it one motive at a time because you question why. Why have you been sleeping on KFC your whole life? And in doing so, you you do that. Yeah, you do that. You make it a better place. What <laughs> of the time? I see chicken, guys. I see chicken. And I sign off. Bye, fuckers. Until the next one. Till the next one. Go. Chicken, 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 chicken time. Bye.